that guy. Well, are you ready for some fun this morning? If anybody calls me Bob the Builder, we're going to talk about that later on. It's already been done, yeah. I'm just going to put that right there. Isn't that cool? You know what? I remember years ago, just uh, first getting my driver's license, being around uh, high school age, and driving through town, and I remember this church, in my, in my own uh, recollection, trying to be built. I remember this church that you would drive by and you would see another sheet of uh, plywood up on the side, then another sheet and another sheet, and then all of a sudden, boom, it was done. And I just remember driving by and uh, going through on a summer day and having to, having to drive through a cloud of smoke, not really uh, paying attention, windows down and, <laughs> you know, breathing through. Uh, the, the windows is, is coming through all this burnt rubber, you know. This is all when I was a kid. I'm thinking, what kind of a crazy church would do all of this stuff? And, and, and look at this. And then I remember driving by, because I grew up in this area, born here, raised here, baptized here, everything driving up and down Highway 61, and then I see this church begin to be built. And again, it's just a little at a time. I remember seeing the, the land being cleared and then a hole in the ground. I mean, all this stuff, just a little at a time, and always so curious. What goes on in that place? What's going on there at this place called Maranatha? All I know is I would, Bobby Headley would run into Karen Sieber at the store or something, and she would be so excited, she would always be inviting me to church every time. I'm sure she invited some of you to church too, just like me. But I was already working at a church, and then I came over to Maranatha, and I wondered what would it be like to serve and minister here, and God gave me that, because one day I drove by with my wife, and I said those, those very words. We were driving by, and I said, honey, what would it be like to lead worship in that place? And it wasn't more than just a couple months later that, uh, that God called me here, and I got to find out. So right now, I would like to call uh, Pat Morley. And what you're watching are some, some uh, slides of the church here. And then we're going to have a, a greeting from Pastor Mike. But there are a number of guys here who were a part of this. Pat, of course, John uh, Sullivan. There was uh, Jim, John uh, Johnson, uh, Jim Geisen. Let's see, Dave Lent, Greg Olson, Jim Wilcox, Paul and Mark Spankison, Ken Anderson, Dab, uh, Dan Cabriana, uh, a whole bunch of guys. So where's Pat? Pat, come on up. A whole bunch of guys that were, were a part of this. And Pat is going to lead us through in just a second here. But we're going to get through all of these slides. But today is Builders Sunday, the day that we are going to honor those who put in the, the hard work and the sweat, the effort, the drawings, all of this stuff that went into Maranatha becoming, or the, the building, I should say, becoming what it is today. So enjoy these slides. Did you ever wonder what was behind those screens? It's the big hole back there. It's a big room. morning. Come on up, you guys. Jim, Jim Lowell, Danny, Dave Lent. I know Paul's here, Paul and Mark Stankinson. Come on, come on, don't be shy. Come on. I'm just looking at this uh, Pastor Mike. Do you know where he is right now? Uh, he's on a bike ride out on the West Coast. 
said he's sorry that he's not here, but I offered to go in, in his place so he could be here. But it took him one second to turn that down. But uh, he needed a vacation. He needed a rest. Oh, Jim Geisen's here. Hi, Jimmy. Why don't you guys come on up here? Jim, you stay here. The new, the new builders. These are. This is an old guy here. There's another old guy here. A couple of them couldn't be here today. We had uh, John Sullivan was instrumental in the old church. John Johnson kind of took care of my joke because we had two Jims and two Johns. So I thought of that commercial, Jimmy Johns, but <laughs> they aren't. You know, they aren't here. But especially the Jims and the Johns, what they sacrificed. You know, they, they have families, they had the jobs, they're business owners. They spent hours and hours and days and days and weeks and much time at the church. I'm just going to have Jim share a few things. What comes to your mind, Jim? I got a couple, but... Uh, I know you do, too. <laughs> I guess as I was sitting uh, watching the screen, I'm looking at the equipment, and it looks so new, and it uh, barely used. And I know Jim and I were got a drag line to put the roof trusses up on the original building over there, and uh, we realized as we drove in the end of the building, it was too wide to get them up, so Jim had a rope on one end, and He's trying to hold it this away so it could get up, and we're on the top of the walls. <laughs> it's a drag line. It has no control. <laughs> and Jim's about 10 feet off. He said, okay, the roof is going to rope. <laughs> we got it up there, though, and it felt like a bug up there with a 60-foot fly swatter. <laughs> so, and a bunch of other things, but we got her done. I remember you talking about that, Jim. I got a call from Jim one day. The wall's crooked. The great big north wall was it? How many feet up in the air was that thing? Sure it wasn't 50? I mean, it was way up there. I had a little four-wheel drive pickup truck, and I drove it over there. Here's Jim way up on the top of that wall. And I'm, what, did you have a rope on it or something, a cable? Hooked it to the back of the pickup truck, and we're sitting there lining that, <laughs> lining that thing up. Something I'll never forget. How that thing stood that long is beyond me, but... It was unreal. How about you, Jim? Well, I guess it's, uh, if the Lord doesn't build it, we labor in vain, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the philosophy here. But I remember we all got together, and uh, we were going to do this all volunteer, right? And so I get to the job site, and the first person I see is, is Pastor Doug out there. He's digging, he's digging the foundation. And, and, and I know his background is that of a stucco contractor, and a, you know, a good one at that, but you know, it, was, it was really uh, the Lord's will to have that first building built, looking back on it now after all these years. But, <clears throat> but as Jim said, I distinctly remember these 20-foot these walls up there, and I was working with a partner at that point, and um, he's up there, and he darn near fell off this wall. Drag line that the, the bar joists came around and he hung right on the back end. I don't know if OSHA was even in existence back then, but, <laughs> but it, it was it was a bad bad situation. It you know that went through. So, but all in all, everything worked out. Here we are today. It's definitely the Lord's will that we are here today. It was definitely the Lord that brought us through to the point where we are today. Amen. Lest anybody get confused, uh, I wasn't a builder. I mean, I can barely pound a nail. Uh, like, like Jim said, uh, Pastor Doug had us. I mean, we were the grunts. A lot of us were the grunts. We would come over there. Here's a shovel. Start digging. And, which was fine. Then the next day, you'd have a backhoe over there digging. You know what? We, in two minutes, what we took us five hours to dig. I could never figure that out. But it was fun, wasn't it, Pastor Doug? <laughs> I'm going to go over here to uh, Mr. Dave Lent, and he was uh, the general, the boss on, on this wonderful building here. 
I'm just going to ask him to say a few words. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm not a public speaker. I'm a builder. Uh, but I remember back when uh, the project was going to take off. And uh, the Lord, uh, you know, 30 years ago is a long time. But God had a plan 30 years ago for this church. And you're only a part of the way there today. You know, 30 years ago was a long time. 20 years ago, or I don't know, what, how long has this place been here? 15 years since we built? The Lord brought Paul Savankinson into the church. And Paul Savankinson had a, a vision for building the church. And Paul put the project, uh, he started it out. They, they came up with a set of plans. And when they got done with the plans, they selected three general contractors to bid the project. And when, and, and when they built, <clears throat> bid the project out, it cost too much money. And so they went to their knees and they asked God, 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 what are we going to do? We, we've got we to build. Our building is too small. What, what's our future, God? You've, got a, you've shown us a plan, a blueprint. You've set Paul Savankinson in our life. And he's drawn a drawing for us. He's given a, he, you've given us a vision. What, what's what's going to happen now, God? And I'm sure the whole church prayed that God would help them see the, through this process. And God moved in a miraculous way. They called me, of all people. And I, I uh, met with the building committee, put some numbers together, and I said, you know what, You're, you only have enough money to build what you can see right here, not the, re not the reception area or, or anything on the other side of those doors right there. That's all the money you have. But, and they said, okay, well, let's, let's do that. Let's do that much. And you stepped out in faith, and God met you. And God said, you know what? Well, I'm going to help Dave save some money here, some value engineering, so that you can go ahead and, and pour the footings for the rest of it. So I did the numbers, and I came up with some value engineering, and I came back to the office, and I said, I think you have enough money to at least pour the footings, because you haven't sold your building yet, but if we pour the footings, maybe God will sell the building for you. And so we poured the footings out there. The church said, well, in faith, we'll step forward and see if God will meet us halfway with the cost. And God met you halfway with the cost of the footings. A couple of weeks later, I say, it's time to order the steel. You haven't sold your building yet, but we need to order all the steel for the other building. Because if we don't order the steel, you won't be able to have it later if you do sell the building. And God met you. He, he, you came to me and said, okay, we'll do it. And God met you. Met you halfway. He said, if you take a step, I'll take a step with you. God was there. And when we finished the project, God was with us. We built the project for $600,000 less than the lowest bidder that you had on the project. Praise God. He was with you. God had a plan. Over 30 years ago, Dr. Cho, does anybody know who Dr. Cho is? Dr. Cho came to Minnesota just over 30 years ago. And he said, I've got a plan for Minnesota. God told me. He's going to pour out His Spirit on all of the United States, but it's going to start here in Minnesota. And God had a plan before He planted this church. He had a plan to move in a mighty way. And He had you in their plan. But He asks, will you seek me? Will you humble yourself? Will you call on my name? Will you seek my face? If you seek His face and humble yourself and call on His name, He will use you to, to fall upon this nation. A mighty move of God. He wants to use this church. He had you in mind. Thirty years ago, before you started, He had you in His dreams. You're part of His dream. You're part of His vision. Fulfill your destiny. Call on the name of the Lord. Seek His face. And He will meet you more than halfway. Preach it, brother. I can go back to uh, 
talking about God being in everything, we all know that. When we bought the original land for the original church, where Cub Foods is right now, $30,000 we paid for that piece of property. God was in it from the beginning. Amen. Kenny. Well, I think Dave missed his calling. I think he, uh, he should be a pastor or a minister. Uh, I, I just want to give, uh, at the time, I, uh, Paul and I were the owners of Hypertech, and I think it was Paul's first Sunday he ever came to Maranatha. He stopped in, and they were just talking about building the building. Well, afterwards, Paul walked up to Mike, and he told Mike, we're, uh, we're a design firm. We'll do the design on it. And, uh, and Paul came to the office the next day. He said, hey, I stopped at Maranatha. I was going to Redeeming Love at the time because, well, my sister and her husband are the pastor there. And uh, um, Mike did not know Paul. He thought he was a nutcase at that time. He figured he, he wanted something because uh, Paul said, uh, I told Mike we would do the design and uh, uh, we'd do it for nothing. And this is a 50,000 square foot building, so it's, you know, there's probably a thousand hours of engineering in it. So Paul came, he told me that. I said, okay. At the time, we, we were probably 10 to 12 person firm. And I said, we were pretty busy. I said, can we physically get it done? I mean, is there enough, to, is there hours enough to do it in the next 12 months? He said, well, you know, we're just going to have to make it work. Well, the next day I get a call from Mike, or I called him, I think, because Mike knew me through, you know, Mike Smith. Um, he married uh, Mike and Arlene, and he knew my mother. My mother used to own a restaurant at the Village Inn where um, uh, that little cafe right down was a Zaz. In fact, Doug and Annie used to go down on her prayer meetings on Thursday nights weekly. And so Mike knew me, and he says, uh, Ken, what's going on? I said, well, we, we want to offer to do the design. And the, the short and long of it is we, we did the design, we did get it done, and at the end of that year, when they, you know, when we did our books and we paid all our bills, covered all our expenses, all our costs, all our wages, our profit, which had been pretty consistent over a half a dozen years, was up 10 times that we distributed amongst the employees. So, I, you know, I kind of throw that in because Mike's been talking on tithing and it's just, Hey, it, you know, it just proved it out. <laughs> it's funny how that works. Hey, Mark. Hey, Pat. I'm kind of a second role player for these guys, you know. Um, Paul, Paul said, he said, we're going to design that building. He says, Mark, uh, you know, buildings in, in America need to have plans to be able to build them. You have to have engineering drawings and you have to have a professional engineer sign them. Well, I'm an electrical engineer, Paul's a mechanical engineer, and he says, we're going to design this building. And I said, great, sounds exciting. So I just had an opportunity to help out, that's all. Well, there's been a lot of incredible miracles through the 30 years that has brought Miranatha to this point. But they are nothing. And even the blessings of every miracle sitting in the, every seat here, every one of you are a miracle. But I, I testified this morning that the plan of God before this church is big. We've thought big before, but not in a way where the Lord's thinking today. He is telling you to raise your sights, saturate in the word, form your prayer altars, and harvest Minnesota for Jesus Christ. This community belongs to the Lord. You are positioned for this hour and this day to bring in the harvest. The Lord has just selected you, and it's the joy of his heart to just move each and every one of you now into the fullness of your destiny. I thank you. I thank each and every one of you because none of this is possible without the hearts and these seeds for Jesus Christ. Amen. We owe these six guys up here a lot of gratitude of what they have sacrificed and done for us, for the Lord. Definitely the Lord was in this house. You remember when Pastor Mike had that vision 
we all thought it was a little weird, but we believed in him. Set the tent stakes out wide, he said. So I really believe this is just the beginning. Amen? Thanks, guys. You can sit down. Appreciate it. Amen. I have the pleasure of asking uh, Pastor Doug, don't sit on. Come on. <laughs> He's going to share some testimony of himself, I believe, and the things that happened in the early church. The early church. It sounds like we're in the Old Testament or something, doesn't it? <laughs> we're old, but not that bad. <laughs> I don't need that thing. Oh, you're wired. I'm wired. wired. Boy, am I ever wired. You only gave me, you only gave me 15 minutes, and my son said he's coming back here Are if I watching? go over. Are so, you really watching oh, it? I'm watching it. I'm a man should under I, authority. Should, do I have to stay up here and watch it with you? Yeah, well, no. you can if you wanna. Hi. Hi. I'm so glad to be here. You know what? You see me running up here, but I had to be careful because no matter where I go, I take my sword with me. You know, I'm not going to read out of this thing today, but I carry it with me because, you know, you can't be caught out in warfare without your sword, right? When I was in the Army, you know, training to go to Korea, if we uh, happened to drop our rifle, our weapon was a rifle then, not a sword, if we dropped that thing, we had to sleep with it. And boy, let me tell you, that thing is not good to sleep with. <laughs> oh, not like my wife. <laughs> Praise God. You know, this church, this building, and this church, you're the church. Now, do you know that, don't you? We've got to specify that right away now. We can get so carried away with building a building and stuff, you know that we forget sometimes what it's all for and what it's all about. And I want you not to leave this place today without knowing for sure in your hearts that you're the church. You're the rocks that God is building for his church. Hallelujah. Say amen, somebody. You got it, boy, now we're right on track. And you know what? He started building this church long before any of us that are involved in it right now had any idea at all. He picks somebody and he follows through with them and he trains them. You know, they talked about some of the problems we had building. You know what? They're good. Don't ever think that problems aren't good because we learn. We make mistakes in life and look at what God has done with us because we learned our lesson. The world out there, they haven't learned yet, see? That's why they're out there. But we're the church. And I want to just start off exhorting you for one thing. When you think about how you were raised, how religious and how you had to go to a building and you had to, you know, just honor it so much. I want you to turn that building into what your friends and your neighbors are. And I want you to, when you're around them, have that same awesome respect for the church of God. Watch what you do in there. Watch what you say in there. Watch how you act around the church. Now, I sure got a big amen out of that. <laughs> I wish I could preach. I really do. Because I, boy, I tell you, I, sometimes I get so stirred up. This church started way back. The people started way back. When my wife got saved, my wife got saved even way back from that because she was a good religious person. I'm here to make a statement and I want you to learn it the rest of your life that God hates religion. Oh, do I get, I got a few faint amens. Come on, I need some bigger ones. Come on, there's all kinds of religions and there's all kinds of things we can do that are religious things. But are we a Christian? Does Jesus Christ live in us and shine out through us? That's the whole object and that's the beginning and that's the end of everything. He started this church way back 
way back when my dad, who almost drowned, he was moved to Wisconsin from out here, and, and he come home one night, and he was going to go out and tinker on the boat, the boat motor, make it tuned up and stuff. And he was out in the middle of the lake on a Thursday night, nobody out there. And he seen the anchor started to slip. So he got up out of his seat and he reached for the rope. And just then it hit and over the side he went. My dad was a big guy. He had uh, blockages in his arteries. He was taking dynamite pills. And he was out there, he couldn't swim, fully clothed. And that boat was going round and round on that anchor. So, boy, I tell you, there was no way of escaping. He knew he was gonna die. And he was religious enough and he heard enough things that he had heard that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he called on the name of the Lord to save him. He didn't call on the name of the Lord to save his earthly body. He had resigned himself that he was going to die. But he wanted to go to heaven. He knew there was some way of getting there. And a miracle happened. A miracle started right there in his life because Jesus come walking on the water, reached out and held him up till a boat came. There was three guys in that boat and I believe they were angels. And my dad was so calm, he told them because they had a little bit of fear, you know, they were gonna tip the boat over and stuff. And, he says, don't be afraid. He says, the Lord's got a hold of me. They helped him in the boat, put him over on the shore, and he sat there. Somebody called the sheriff. They come out and got the boat and everything. They asked him if he wanted to go to the doctor, to the hospital. Ma was worried, you know, because he had this blockage, and he died from it eventually, a year, a year later. I got to say that now before I forget it. The Lord told him he had a year to live. Well, isn't that something? How many people do, of you, do you know when you're going to die? Told my dad, and I didn't keep track, but a year later he died, and I bet it was right to the day. It was probably to the hour even, because it was at the end of the day when he was working and he was cleaning off his shoes. He was spraying the ceiling. He was a sheet rocker, and he dropped over dead. Right then, just like that. But his life changed. My dad came and told us all about that story, every one of us, and we all wanted to know, well, what's this all about? So my sister out in Seattle got saved first, and she come out here, and I married, I, I'm telling you, I married to the most religious, devout lady that God ever had, but now he loved her enough that he, he calls her sister now, see? She got saved first. And that lady, as good as she was, I'd come home from work, and she'd be reading the Bible of all things. She's raised Catholic, can't understand that thing, can't read that thing. And she, I'd come in down in a foyer and she'd, honey, 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 here, come up here and see what this says. She was all excited, she could understand it. You know, because the Bible we find out says that a carnal man can't understand spiritual things because they're spiritually discerned, amen? And all of a sudden she was spiritual and she could understand it all. And boy, she was hard to live with. Because she was, she was even better than she was before. I mean, my goodness, things, miracles. I, I haven't got enough time to tell you all the things that happened, but I was so impressed with that lady. Well, I was impressed enough to marry her. Uh, to begin with, my daddy, I asked him once, I said, how do you know what love is, Dad? What, what, you know, tell me what love is. You know, just a young man, I wanted to know. And you can all listen very carefully to this because this is good advice. Love is a condition of the mind when the mind is out of condition. <laughs> anyway, my sister got saved. She came out here and got her to go to a Bill Gothard seminar. My wife changed so much that I, six months later, he come back and I went on Thursday night because that's the night that they all got something happened to them, you know? Well, that's the night he gave the invitation to accept Jesus Christ. And it happened to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Something happened inside of me. I was born again. There's really been a change in me. 
born again just like Jesus said. Born again and all because of Calvary. I'm glad, so glad that I've been born again. Aren't you glad? Give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. Well, behold, old things pass away and all things become brand new. My life changed and I did just like my dad. I started talking about all the good moral things, you know. I didn't have my mind on all the bad things in the world. And my kids, they started to see the difference too. Mike said, you know, in one of his first sermons, he said, they're, they're falling like flies. Everybody was getting saved. And then he got saved. You heard his testimony too. See, God's got a plan, and all we got to do is fit into that plan and keep saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, hallelujah. And you know what? He changed us. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want everybody to know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want people to know that they can become part of the church of Jesus Christ. They can grow up into him into all things. They can become part of his family. You know what? There's no priesthood anymore. There's no Levites. There's no priesthood anymore. Because he made the final sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Now, it sounds like I'm talking about building the church, don't it? But I am talking about building the church. Because that's the only way to build the church, is to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Then you can sing, Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I've been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, saved by His wonderful grace. Hallelujah. Do you feel like singing? <laughs> What? I, I tell you what, oh, I only, got, I only got eight minutes. You know, I'm not used to this. When I started at church, I'd preach for an hour. And the service might go an hour and a half if, it, if you were lucky. I mean, otherwise it'd go two hours. We had no time limits. Mike's the one, you know, he got so refined, you know, that, and you got to have schedules now. You know what I mean? But I'd keep you here till you, it, we careful we don't sit on the windows because you might fall asleep and fall out the window. We have to go down and stop the service and go out and pray for you to get healed and get raised up again. That's the way they did it. Are you excited? I, I can't even tell you how to build a church. I had tent meetings. I got saved and I started having tent meetings. I got involved in Tri-County Evangelistic Association as a Catholic. And I got, we had more people working in the, in the Tri-County Crusades from the Catholic Church than any other church in town. Now that's a miracle. Come on. Say amen. Hallelujah. Then we went from there. I, I started renting tents and setting them up on Main Street and had evangelists come in. I started renting at Kwan Yee's basement, putting on suppers. I remember Richard Eng when I invited him to come. He was from Temple Baptist Church, and that year that I invited him, he was named by the Pioneer Press the Pastor of the Year. You know, he built a big church down there and stuff, and very involved. And I had him come up to the Catholic Church, a Catholic group. We were in Kwan Yee's restaurant in the basement. And, of course, we had some neighboring... Now, I'm, I'm telling you some facts, but I'm not telling you these things for so you can get a critical spirit towards the other parts of the body of Christ. I absolutely hate that. We got to stop it. We're only a part of the body of Christ. I'm going to give you one little quick story and then I'll go back to the others. I, I can't tell you much in six minutes, but I used to get mail when I first got ordained in the ministry and started the church. And that's a whole story in itself. But, um, uh, it used to come abbreviated, you know, and through the computer age, and they would abbreviate assembly. It was ASS of God. <laughs> and I'd, I'd be speaking, I'd go to Catholic churches. I'd, I had speaking engagements before I was ever even ordained, but uh, 
I'd go and I'd speak to these prayer groups and, and churches and stuff, and I'd, I'd bring that letter or some of these letters along and I'd show them. And I said, that's, if that's the part of the body of Christ, and I'm going to tell you that too, that I'm at, I'm proud to be there because the rest of you, I said, aren't going to be able to sit down. <laughs> Praise God. You know, I, I only got just a few minutes, so I'm going to sing another song, can I? Because <laughs> these songs, the song that I just sang is one I sing every time I get invited out to go to one of your parents that's a Catholic and dying. You know, and I tell them when I get there, I'm going to sing them a song before I leave. And every one of them have accepted Jesus in that song. They went to their grave singing that song, Hallelujah. But this one is... Uh, <clears throat> I was sitting here in a Bible study a month ago and we were talking about the church and the building and stuff, you know, and what the Lord has done. And I started looking around and I seen all this. And, you know, a little farm boy from Wisconsin who went off to Korea and seen how people live in other parts of the world and seen death. <laughs> I serve an awesome God, don't I? I want to tell you something about Korea. I've got two minutes left. The lights were out in that country. Till Dr. Chow, who was somebody just, somebody just mentioned him. He got saved from one of our missionaries from Minnesota. That's something when he was a little kid and got healed. He had something wrong with him. I don't remember the whole story. But he's got the biggest church in the world right now you can only go to service there once a month otherwise it's all house meetings and stuff you know when the gospel light north korea is probably the poorest worst country in the whole world now because there's no light of the gospel there they've closed it off the devil has put up a curtain we have an enemy out there but the gospel light shines and we got to keep it shining here because they're sending missionaries over to America now. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. I want to sing. I want you to think now and look around and see. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He saved my body. He healed my mind. He saved me and you just in time. Oh, I'm going to praise his name. Each day is just the same. Do, 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 do. <laughs> well, anyway, look what the Lord has done. I look at all your smiley faces. The most important thing I can say here is when I look at the church, Right here, I get such a happy, warm heart. I mean, you're the most beautiful building I've ever been a part of. And don't ever forget that. I look at you, and I can smile, and I can be happy. Hallelujah. Now, I'm getting uh, right up to one minute to go, and he's got to close. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have him put a scripture verse on the on the on the screen here. You know, we hear a lot about sin. Pastor Mike just uh, preached on sin. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, he challenged. We don't hear that word no more. But this we don't hear very often either. Because that's the sin he was talking about is the, the committal of, of a sin doing something wrong. But this sin is one of not doing what's Right. This refers mostly to the Lord speaking to his church. Every one of you have got a mission. Every one of you have got a call. And if you're not listening to that call and you're not answering that call, to you the Bible says it is sin. Hallelujah. That's the sin of omission, not commission. We don't hear sermons on that. But you heard one right now, and I got to close with that. But I, 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 I got to say, I have a song. We can't close the service without a song. It says, uh, 
because I want this for each one of you. I don't know if you're going to find out how the church was built or not, but the church is being built with you. Oh, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known God bless you Pastor Doug hold on hold on sir I'm just going to ask you to, uh, wasn't this a great Sunday? Just fun. We had a lot of things going on up here, but you know, I think, you know, these first Sundays of the month, what a, what a great time for uh, mo- lots of us, most of us, to uh, learn about the rich history of Maranatha and to hear from you today and to hear you sing to us and, and to the Lord. What a treasure for us. Pastor Doug, would you uh, say a prayer for us and dismiss us this morning? Yes. Father God, it's a joy and a privilege to be able to be a spokesman for you to your church, to your people, your rocks. Lord, I thank you for each and every one of them. I thank you for the lessons they're learning, the trials they go through. But we know temptation, you don't tempt anybody. But trials, you come to make us strong. The words that I want everyone to hear are your words, Lord. Bring them comfort. Bring them healing and bring them strength of your Holy Spirit. May they rely on you and your spirit to lead them down this straight and narrow path. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Don't forget, you got candy bars, bike show, all kinds of stuff in the lobby. Have a great day, everybody. See you next week.